Welcome everybody to this uh, book showcasing which we are organizing in the framework of our little workshop on student notes which is entitled in full How to Investigate Student Notes from uh, the Renaissance which will be hosted uh, from the KU Leuven but of course everybody will be in their own houses unfortunately still due to the COVID pandemic and this is also the reason why we are making this video because we want to have the opportunity to showcase some treasures we have at our university library which is unfortunately not possible to do on site uh, under the current circumstances. So and the treasures we are going to show are all trilingual treasures in the sense that they relate to the three so-called sacred languages which were taught at the Collegium Trilingue or the Three Language College which was founded in 1517 under the will of Jerome of Busselade and whose guiding spirit was Desiderius Erasmus and these treasures all stem from this Collegium Trilingue, this mythological entity um, that was housed once uh, between the walls of our beautiful university. So what we're going to do is to, to go ad fontes to the sources as the famous humanist battle cry of Erasmus goes um, and we're going to present to you um, grammar books, textbooks that have to do with uh, Latin literature, uh, Greek literature, Greek grammar and Hebrew uh, grammar and literature. So and I've collected a wonderful team of scholars to present you our trilingual uh, treasures. So and we'll start out with Latin. Here I have put together a nice Virgilian triptych as it were, all linked to Louvain and the Collegium Interlingue. The steering person behind these booklets is none other than Petrus Nanius, who was the third professor of Latin at the college. Now, if we take a look at his almost 20 year long curriculum, we can clearly and quickly see that he had a soft spot for the grades of the golden age of Latinity. Cicero, Livy, Horace and Lucretius. But one name above all stands out, Virgil. And throughout his career, he lectured on the three works by Virgil, the Bucolics, Georgics, and of course, the Aeneid. In September 1544, Nanius published his text edition and commentary on the fourth book of Virgil's Aeneid. It was published by his close colleague at the Trilingue, Rutger Rescus. In a dedicatory letter to one of his favorite students, Louis Etienne Césarion Chapuis, Nanius explained why he wrote down the commentary. It so happens that he was reading Homer and Virgil side by side and that he noticed many similarities between both the texts. But when he thought about these similarities in class, he quickly felt that his students did not fully uh, grasp uh, the extent of these similarities. And this was mainly due to the discrepancy between the writing of Greek on one hand and the pronunciation of that language on the other. If we take a closer look at the commentary, we can indeed see that Homer plays an important role in it. Homer is mentioned over 20 times and more often uh, with the original Greek than not. And this Greek text is also accompanied by a Latin translation Nanius uh, made himself. There are 10 copies of this book kept worldwide and of all the copies that I have uh, personally seen, only this one kept here in Louvain is annotated. Unfortunately, the annotator remains anonymous. And in a rebinding process, the bookbinder unfortunately cut off some of the annotations. Yet they are clearly student notes because they are both interlinear and marginal notes. So perhaps they date or they stem from within uh, Nanius's classroom walls. When Nanius was about to start lecturing on new text, he usually kicked things off with a prefatory oration. In 1541, for example, he had already published three of them, one of which was on Virgil's Georgics. In 1544, he held an oration on love, this uh, as um, an introduction to the reading of the fourth book of Virgil's Aeneid. Now, perhaps his most uh, significant prefatory oration uh, he delivered in 1545. It is his Oratio de Rebus Inferorum.
Technically speaking, this oration is not a prefatory oration because Nanius actually delivered it in between classes on the sixth book of Virgil's Aeneid. The sixth book of Virgil's Aeneid deals mainly with uh, Aeneas uh, going to the underworld, uh, and this is duly reflected in this oration in which Nanius, together with Virgil, descends down into the underworld. Anonius' oration was eventually published posthumously in 1611 by Iricus Putianus, and since then every trace leading to the manuscript was lost. That is, until 1914, when it was found by accident here in the university library when people were moving about some furniture. And it thus survived two, uh, the two configurations of our university library, both in 1914 and 1940. The text was eventually critically edited by Henri de Vogt in 1955. This document is moreover the only piece in the entire collection that since the genesis of it in 15, 1545 up until now has continuously been in our collections. The last book that I would like to showcase here today is a Zammelband um, containing four Virgil prints printed here in Louvain in the 16th century. It contains the 11th and 12th book of the Aeneid published by Servatius Sassenus in 1549, but also um, the first and the second book of the Georgics printed respectively in 1567 and 1568. All four Sassenus editions are extremely rare. For example, of the edition of the 12th book of the Aeneid, there are only two copies known worldwide, including this one. All four booklets are annotated by the same yet anonymous 16th century hand. And the book is also completely interfoliated and contains many annotations both interlinearly and marginally, which suggests that these are also uh, student notes. And moreover, the extreme scarcity of the book and the fact that it was produced mainly for Louvain students suggests that these notes perhaps too are uh, were taken in Louvain. In any case, this Samoband deserves a detailed study. So I'm going to present to you uh, three little treasures uh, from the university uh, library, um, all related to the study of Greek in, in the Low Countries and more particular uh, in Leuven. The first one is, is this little uh, booklet, which is uh, called on its title page the Theodori uh, Langi uh, Schedia, so the, the notes, the draft notes of Theodorus uh, Langius. So this is the notebook not of a student but of a professor, namely Theodoricus Langius or Theodorus Langius, the third professor uh, of Greek at the Collegium uh, Trilingue uh, or the so-called Free Language uh, College here in Leuven. He was from uh, the Netherlands, the northern Low Countries, from Enkhuizen, but he studied in Leuven with the first professor of Greek, namely Rutger uh, Rescius, and he also taught uh, at the Latin school of Alkmaar in the northern Low Countries, uh, where Petrus Nanius was a rector about whom you've already heard before. Then in 1533 he moved southward, going to uh, France, to Bordeaux more in particular, where he taught for 10 years at the Collège de Guyenne. But then he came back to his alma mater, to Leuven, uh, where he became a private teacher and also a substitute uh, teacher at the Three Language College. So he replaced uh, mainly Adrianus Amirotius uh, when uh, Amirotius was traveling or out of uh, town. And perhaps this position at the Collegium Trilingue was due to uh, Ruart Tapper, who was a very influential man here in Leuven, and who was also from Enkhuize, just like uh, Theodoricus Langius. And we have very specific information about Theodoricus Langius' lessons, not from student notes, unfortunately. Thus far, we have no notebooks uh, that have been produced during his course that have come to light again. But we do have a very interesting um, testimony about his courses on the 6th of October, 1550. On that day, Langius read uh, Oedipus uh, Rex, a tragedy, at a rate of 21 verses 
in one lesson. And we know that about 80 students were present in, in this course and that after the course, the professor Langius received a very warm applause uh, from his uh, students and much to the envy of the English Hellenist Roger Ascham. When Amero, the second professor of Greek, died in January 1560, Theodorus Langius was the obvious choice to succeed Amero. And this is what he also would do until his death in 1578, or at least he tried to do it as much as possible because he went blind very soon and also got a limp, which made it very difficult for him to, to uh, yeah, realize the duties of his Greek chair. And he was soon also um, substituted by other professors of Greek, such as uh, Petrus Pierius Asmenga, who was uh, also the Hebrew professor at the Trilingue for uh, some time. So there's not a lot of material on Theodorus Langius, unfortunately, but we do have one very precious document um, that survives from his otherwise lost library, and which he left to the Collegium Trilingues library as well. And that, that's this uh, Scedia, so these notes. Uh, books which were bought by Henry de Vogt, uh, you know, uh, the, the star historiographer of the Collegium uh, Trilingue. So currently this, this, this notebook by Theodorus Langius is, is catalogued in our university library's system as part C of Corneli Valeri ab Auwater Collectania, but obviously it's not only stuff uh, by uh, Cornelius Valerius, but also uh, by Langius. So it's, it's a bit, uh, the cataloging by De Vogt was not ideal, let's say. What is in it? It's, it's, a, it's an old bunch of very different things. It's an overview of symbols, such as an asterisk or also an obelus, for instance. There's also a treatise on, on Greek meter, on a folium for verso. Uh, for instance, there is a nice depiction of, of a scheme of iambic verses here. Um, there's also uh, an argumentum of Iphigenia in Aulis, uh, perhaps as a sort of uh, accompaniment to his courses or something. And this is, is more generally a, a very important topic in this, in this uh, Scedia because there's a lot of information on tragedy. So it seems that he was very fond of tragedy and that he loved teaching uh, this genre. Because in fact, there's even a short treatise on tragedy as a genre, which starts on volume uh, six verso, it's about here. And there he treats uh, different questions about tragedy, such as quid docet tragoidia, so what teaches tragedy, differentia inter tragoidiam et comodiam, so what's the difference between uh, tragedy and the comedy, and also comodo dividitur et in quas partes et quae requiruntur in tragico uh, poeta, so how is a tragedy divided into parts in, and into which parts and uh, which uh, elements are expected in a tragic uh, poet. There's also uh, a, a part on uh, the life and works of Euripides on volume 17, uh, that is about right about here. Um, there's also some notes on Greek words and their different meanings, uh, information on Greek authors and other historical uh, figures without any clear structure. So that's one of the guiding features of this document. There is no clear structure. Um, there are also grammatical notes and, and what seem to be Greek reading notes. So we can, can, we can conclude that these, yeah, these might be course preparations, but might also have been a personal reading book, or maybe it's a combination of both. And I, I think that's, that's uh, the case. And the notes, as I've said, they are not very organized, unfortunately, as if someone threw them on the ground and mixed them around and put them back together. So that's the state we have this text uh, collection in, and somebody should really look into it and try to organize it again, because Henri de Vogt didn't do a very good job, uh, but he, that's one of the few blemishes on his, on his record. So then we can move on to 
our second trilingual treasure, but in my case monolingual because I'm only talking about Greek, of course. And that's this uh, Homeric print, uh, printed by uh, Thierry Martens in 1523. So it's the Odyssey, the, the second of, of uh, Homer's famous uh, epics. And this book is a rare testimony to the ties the English Hellenist Richard Croke had with Loewe. His name is on the title page, so we have his Ex Libris, which is striked out, um, Ricardus Crocus, and then a nice Greek phrase, Sun Theo, uh, with the, the, the help or with the grace of God or something. Um, and what's the, the tie of Croak with Loewe? Um, he was here in 1511, 1514 in those years, and according to his own words, he taught Greek here in private for some time. So he was a long, he was one of those pioneers who studied with Girolamo Alejandro in Paris in the years before, together with uh, Rutgerescu, the first professor of Greek at the Trilingue, and Adrien Amaro, the second professor. Um, but Croke was, was also one of those uh, guys, but he didn't stick around in Leuven. He moved on first to Germany and then back to to um, England, where he started teaching Greek in Cambridge. And that was in, in the 1520s that he took up this uh, position. And it's perhaps in his capacity of professor of Greek in England that he bought this book, because this book was printed in 1523, so almost 10 years after he was in Leuven to teach Greek. So, and why is this the case? Um, that has to do with the book market probably, because in England there were no Greek presses at the time, so th th it was not commercially profitable to, to print Greek books in, in, in the early 16th century England. It was much more, 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 it was much cheaper to import them from, from the continent and, and uh, use those uh, books. Then I move on to my third monolingual, trilingual uh, treasure, namely this book, which uh, contains, uh, among other things, Theognis' poems in an edition of 1521, published by Johannes Froben in Basel. It belonged to Franz van Kraneveld, who was a doctor in both laws, alumnus of Leuve University, and city pensionary of uh, Bruges, and also member of the Great Council in Mechelen. He was a jurist but also a humanist who wrote Latin and even some Greek verses. And his poetry was wanted mainly because of the fame of, of the author and rather than its quality, uh, or at least that's the judgment of, of uh, Professor Emeritus Tirik Sacre, whom I dare not to contradict. Um, his network also comprised Erasmus, Juan Luis Bibes, uh, Thomas More, among other uh, prominent humanists, and he was an early admirer of the star Neo-Latin uh, poet uh, Janus Secundus. And his fascination with the Greek language and literature has a powerful as uh, a testimony in this uh, Basel uh, book from Frobe. Because Cranavel translated uh, Theognis, a 6th century BC uh, poet, into Latin and, and even in Latin verses, so not in Latin uh, prose. And apparently he was the first to do so, and which is quite a feat, because Theognis' text was not yet ideally edited and there were many textual uh, difficulties. His rather literal translation with some medieval threads never reached print, however. He never it intended it for publication either, probably because he realized that he could not compete with really, truly uh, literary translators. Uh, and this, for instance, telling that he incorporated Erasmus's translations of selected verses, uh, which he found in Erasmus's Adagia. Um, and, and he used them in his own translation. So this suggests that he had more confidence in Erasmus than in his own uh, translating uh, skills. Another remarkable feature of this, of this translation is that he realized that this, this translation of 1,218 Greek uh, lines in only three weeks in the early summer of 1541, of which he was very proud because he noted it down in the book. Yes, I realized it's in only three weeks. What a great guy am I. 
And what is even more interesting, apart from this translation, which is in manuscript bound together in this beautiful binding, which is typically for 16th century Leuven, is that uh, also the Greek text is in there, of course, and we find there many marginal and interlinear annotations where um, Kranenveld um, yeah, translated Greek words into Latin as a kind of preparation for his translation, which shows the, the, the artisanal aspect, so to speak, of, of this uh, translation activity. Um, and the result is this beautiful calf-bound binding, which you see here. And if you want to know more about this pioneering Latin translation by Carnevaldius, you can always uh, read the only uh, edition thus far, which is a 1984 MA thesis by Leon Dalemans. Um, and if you want to know more and, and consult a book which is more readily accessible than this MA thesis, which is unfortunately confined to the university library, you can also consult a beautifully written Latin article by the inevitable Joseph Azewan. When Hebrew entered the curriculum of uh, most Western universities at the beginning of the 16th century, beginning Hebrew, Hebraists were in dire need of uh, fitting school books, fitting text editions for learning Hebrew. Now, already at the beginning of the 16th century, uh, an editor like Daniel Bomberg had started printing the most important works of Judaism, like the Hebrew Bible, of course, but also the Talmud and the Mishnah. Uh, but student editions with uh, facing Latin translations were mostly procured by professors of Hebrew, a professor of Hebrew who operated in Rome, in Paris, or in Louvain. Um, most of these uh, student editions um, contained one or more biblical books, uh, of which the most popular was, uh, without doubt, the Book of Psalms. Uh, because the Psalms were short, relatively short texts, uh, already known by heart by most students in their Latin translation. Other biblical books that were uh, popular as uh, learning material were the, was the so-called wisdom literature, or the books of, of uh, Ecclesiastes, of Song of Songs, and of Proverbs. Uh, the book I want to sh showcase now is uh, an example of the latter category, namely uh, of the book of Ecclesiastes and the Song of Songs. It is also a Zammelband in which uh, is contained also the uh, grammars of both Clenardus and Campensis. And especially the book of Ecclesiastes is very densely annotated. If one looks at the first pages, one can see that almost every word in Hebrew is provided uh, of a Latin translation, which is quite remarkable because there is a facing Latin translation by Agatho Guidacerio, the editor of this book, uh, who was an Italian Hebraist operating at, in Rome and Paris. He was also one of the first uh, royal lectors at the Collège Royal in Paris. Now, there are not only uh, word by word uh, translations into Latin, but also notes uh, which treat more uh, realia on the Hebrew text. On this page, uh, we see one such note, which uh, is linked to one uh, Hebrew word. In Hebrew, it is pardes. We know it as paradise, and it means uh, in Hebrew it means orchard. The professor who, uh, who dictated the lesson probably felt a need to explain this word because it was known primarily as paradise, but in this context it clearly means uh, orchard since it's uh, juxtaposed to the word for garden. And he explains, in fact, the difference between a garden and an orchard. A garden being a place in, uh, that possesses many kinds of trees, while an orchard only has one kind of tree in it. Finally, uh, a last type of uh, notes, student notes, which I would like to show you in this edition, uh, is this manicula, or little hand, uh, which is uh, applied uh, by the student to one specific Bible verse, which in Latin reads, infinitus est tultur numerus, or the number of fools is infinite. Truth be told, this note does not tell us much of the practice in the Hebrew classroom, but it gives us uh, an intriguing view into the minds of a young Hebraist who perhaps just read his first uh, piece of original biblical literature. 
the 16th century Brabantian scholar, Nicolaus Clenardus of the East, who was uh, born by the name of Nicolaus Kleinaerts in uh, 1493, has done a number of quite remarkable things. In 1531, he left the Low Countries uh, for the Iberian Peninsula to pursue a study of Arabic, far from evident at the time. And later he crossed uh, to Morocco to study not only Arabic, but also Islam, with the end goal of using his linguistic and cultural knowledge to convert uh, the people of Islam to the truth of Christianity. As may be guessed, this project did not work out quite as he expected. But nonetheless, in contrast to his uh, early 14th century um, Catalan predecessor, Raimundus Lulus, Clenardus did live to tell the tale. Clenardus ultimately died in Granada in 15. 42 and was buried in the Alhambra. But before doing all that, he spent two decades here in Louvain, was among the trilingual college's very first students, and then taught Greek and Hebrew in its shadow. In the last years before he said his final goodbye to Louvain in 1531, Clenardus published his grammars, one of Hebrew and two of Greek which are the grammars which would, we would like to present to you today. So Nicolas Clenardus studied Hebrew at the Collegium Trilingue in Louvain from the professor of Hebrew, Johannes Campensis, who taught Hebrew from 1521 to 1532. An eager student, Clenardus mastered the language in almost no time and soon began assisting his former teacher in teaching it. Uh, in 1528, Johannes Campensis uh, published his very own grammatical overview of Hebrew based on the grammatical ideas of the contemporary Jewish uh, grammarian Elia Levita. But it lacked clear declension tables, it was too dense, too hard for beginning students to use effectively. Clenardus understood this pedagogical flaw and decided to compose his very own grammatical overview of Hebrew using a maximum of clear declension tables and a minimum of explanatory notes with also a very handsome Hebrew type, which is large enough for the beginner's eye. Also note that the Hebrew grammar by Clonardus starts from the backside of the book, so to say, uh, like real Jewish Hebrew books. Uh, we do not know if Clonardus meant this uh, Hebrew grammar as an appendix to uh, the grammar of uh, Campensis, or whether he, would, uh, would, uh, or rather he uh, wanted to rival his former teacher, as suggested also Henri de Vogt. Now, in any case, this grammar was published one year after Campensis' grammar in 1529, at, also at the presses of Thierry Martens, and became an immediate success. It received multiple reprints, most notably in Paris and France, uh, where it was also expanded by the Parisian uh, Hebraist Jean Saint-Carbe in Latin Johannes Quincarboreus. Ironically, it was regarded as being too succinct, and uh, thus it was uh, expanded with extra explanatory notes. This is also uh, the same case in this volume, this uh, first edition of Louvain, held uh, in this library. The student uh, wrote the translations of numerous Hebrew words into Latin, but he also wrote some interesting grammatical notes. There were Clanardus omits extra explanatory notes. For example, this note on nomina perfecta, or perfect nouns, in which the student writes that perfect nouns are nouns in Hebrew which do not lack any root letters, extra, uh, radical letters, uh, and to which are no uh, superfluous letters added. In 1530, Clenardus' Institutiones in Linguam Graicam uh, an introductory handbook of Greek grammar was published in Louvain. Uh, Jerry Martens had uh, shortly before, after printing the Hebrew grammar, uh, retired to his native town of Aalst. So this grammar was printed um, at the printing shop 
newly established by Rutgerescius, who also served at the time as the first professor of Greek. It was not the first uh, grammar of Greek to be published in Louvain. In 1520, um, Jerry Martens had, or had already published another grammar of Greek uh, written by Adrianus Amerotius, who was born Adrian Amero. Amerotius, who had studied Greek in Paris, taught the language privately in Louvain. And ultimately, in uh, 1545, he succeeded Rect uh, Rutgerescius as professor of Greek, a task that he fulfilled until his death in 1560. Amerotius's grammar presumably served as, a, as a, an important help for many students of the language in the years following 1520, until finally it was replaced by Clenardus's grammar of 1530. Probably it served as an important source of inspiration for this grammar. Probably the most remarkable feature of this grammar is a very beautiful table of the Greek verb presented in the form of a tree. And frankly, it is just visually pleasing in all respects. And quite easy to handle. This copy of Clenardus's Institutiones, preserved in Louvain, has been used quite intensively, as is testified by its numerous annotations. And this can clearly be seen on page 23, for example, these notations are found in multiple hands. Typically, these annotations merely add Latin translations to Greek words mentioned in the printed text, but there are also quite a number of other interesting annotations, of which we will mention just a few. For example, on page 27, a mistake in the printed text is corrected. Um, the Greek letter beta is set in passing uh, to represent a voiceless sound, while, of course, it represents a voiced one. And accordingly, the uh, tenuem found in the text is crossed out and replaced by mediam. Interestingly, and perhaps tellingly, um, the pages devoted to the basic verb conjugation have been annotated quite heavily, while the same is not true of the pages devoted to some more advanced topics concerning the Greek verbs, such as uh, contract verbs and athematic verbs. Finally, page 17 has in its upper right corner a rather mysterious annotation, which does not seem to be connected or concerned with anything found on the page or indeed in the grammar. Seemingly, it reads Roi de France Regnant, ruling king of France, but why it has been written there is entirely unclear. In 1531, Rutgerescus printed another work of Clenardus, the Meditationes Graicanicae, Greecizing Meditations, in which the basic grammatical knowledge contained in the Institutiones is applied, much as one would do in the classroom, to the reading of an actual Greek text, uh, specifically a letter by Saint Basil. The Meditationes, in fact, contain many references with indications of page numbers even to the institutiones, to which they were clearly meant to serve as a kind of sequel, allowing students to consolidate their knowledge, their grammatical knowledge, through practice. Clenardus's works on Greek grammar became highly successful and influential, both in the short and the long run. His material was popular all over Catholic and Protestant Europe. It was used in the Jesuits' teaching during the 16th century, and it also heavily influenced the grammar of Jakob Kretzer, which was to become the standard grammar of the Jesuit order by the end of the century. There were countless uh, prints in the 16th century, dozens in the 17th, and even some in the 18th century. All in all, I dare say, 
Plenardus was one of the most popular and successful grammarians of Greek of the entire early modern period. Moreover, during his time in Portugal, he also wrote a grammar of Latin, which was printed in Braga in 1538. Therefore, Plenardus can be said to have written grammars of all three sacred languages, which is just one of the many um, rare feats of these Brabantian humanists. 